I and I know IMG. I know IMG Research Academy. Here I can see your face. Why are you pinned? <laughs> I know IMG Research Academy from the US, but um, I think we're trying to do a collab between Canada and the US to get more of us IMGs um, going into research and then having publications in high impact journals. And so I welcome all of us here this evening. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to do, um, how to write a case report. Edward is our, our main resource person. And um, I, before I go ahead, I want to first thank Edward for this initiative. Thank you for, I, I am right now, I'm part of your IMG Research Academy in the US. Thank you for what you're doing there. And I hope um, we can replicate that with um, the Canada Brethren and have equal success there as well. And so thank you everyone for being here. I hope this eventually becomes a very successful venture for everyone. All right, Chief Harry. Okay, um, welcome everybody um, to this uh, meeting. Evo, I, I know you're representing us in um, Canada. You're, you're doing very well. Um, I see we are about um, 22 now. And um, the agenda for this meeting basically is an um, introduction which has been given by Evo from Canada. Evo, you are a resident in Canada, right? In family medicine. Uh, how did you do it? I don't know anybody who's a resident in Canada. You went there and bribed your way through. You are Nigerian. Yep, yep, don't give me that Christian Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so we have um, the introduction already. Ed is going to give us um, the main talks. We hope this meeting lasts um, 30 minutes, give and take um, 45. We'll have a um, closing um, question and answer session. Then eventually we close. We hope that um, after this uh, meeting in the next uh, few weeks, we should be able to keep pushing out on um, case reports and um, of our own um, independently. So I will call on our, our chief um, resource person, Eddie Okobi. Thank you very much for making our time to um, take it away from here. Eddie, please. Thank you, Dr. Harry. Uh, Dr. Please, if you are not um, talking, just mute your mic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harry and Dr. Evo, for facilitating this um, this conversation. Anything research is usually very boring uh, to so many people. Why? To some people, it's very exciting. To me, it's very exciting. Um, research spans across from basic things like case reports to very complex things like interventional studies that we do. Um, so, but today we're just going to discuss an aspect of the spectrum of research called case report. And before we do that, I just want to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm a member of the CAMS group in Canada, and I'm also, I also have a separate research academy that I run, uh, where we have close to like 100 plus doctors that we try to call, form a group to encourage ourselves into research. We do two types of research, two types of uh, model, the paid model where we guide you through, and the free model where we collaborate as a team and uh, we produce uh, scholarly um, articles. Having said that, because research is generally known as boring to a majority of people, we'll, start with, we'll try and make it very conversational, very interactive. I will not make it like the solo one person talk and hopefully in the next 30 minutes, we should ask reasonable questions and breeze through it. But the, just a foreclosure, whatever I want to say today is not, um, is not how there's a term they use is not encompassing it might not be the entire spectrum just the basic tenets that we can discuss within the time frame that we have uh, for case reports they are, they are divided into two two major aspects a single case report that's one case report then if it's usually greater than two or three they call it the case series um, but there's also another aspect that I want to remind everyone, very important aspect called the image in clinical medicine. You might not have a, an interesting case, but you just have an interesting picture, dermatological picture, surgical procedure, neuroimaging, uh, pathology reports, interesting pathology, pathological finding. And that alone can just be a publication, that, that simple alone. So because we want to do, make today 
uh, an interactive time. Uh, I will be showing you examples of these things so that you can see them in real life. We're, we're not just talking, I can be asking your question. Feel free to stop me at any time within the conversation and uh, ask me questions. Um, I have a little poll here. If you can just type it in your, in your, in your browser, type this poll, www.slido.com, or you just copy this link. Let me see if I can paste the link in the chats. Stop sharing. Just give me one second. See if I can paste that link in the chat so that everybody can just fill it up. It helps me to gauge what we want to do, what your expectations will be. And uh, the link is in the chat. You can click on it and just type in whatever you, there's a response to it. The password is uh, IMG Research Academy, IMG as a link password. So um, let me go there. I don't know if you guys were able to do it on votes. So why has someone done it? Put analytics, show results. Did you just start working on Sunday? Ooh. All right. We'll just give you like two, once one minute to do that. Um, I just want to see what you guys think about you research. And confidence. Also, and All right. So I mean, beyond the green line, Lots of people are confident about case reports. Some are agreeing here to learn. Uh, if we can get more votes, we're like 25. If we can get like 10 more votes, at least. OK, so just put in whatever you feel about uh, clinical, about case reports, then we go from there. I'll, ret I'll return back to my screen. Okay, so I found out the last one. So it's on 82. And the thing with, with the whole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to make it again. So the thing with, uh, can you hear me here? The thing with um, case report is that it's, it depends on perspective. Many of these things, some people will see it and say, oh, it's very difficult. And other people will say it's very easy. Um, the, the tapes I was playing before we started, I, I, I love listening to TDJX a lot. It tells you your mindset, your, mind, your problem comes first from your mind, how you think it, how you view it, and that's how it that's how it is. If you see these two guys, one person will say it's difficult, three, the other person will say, oh no, it's four. It's all a mind thing. Now, who should write a case report? All of us in medical, in this medical field, I assume all of us are all doctors. We know that all of us are going to write case reports someday. Either you're writing it to get into residency or you're writing it you know, to give it as a conference presentation or you're doing it in your uh, your private time as maybe something you love to do or you want to use it as an academic growth, maybe your academic decision, your faculty, or your career researcher like, like me who you know, loves doing this and keeps going. So somehow, somehow you find yourself using this very simple but effective way of communication or in doing clinical research as a tool in life. Uh, So I talked about clinical imaging, and I wanted to give you people, why I said this, I wanted to give you people an example of what clinical imaging is. So I'll share a screen where you could see something, where you could do something, you could see a type of case report that is very easy. Let me share this screen, clinical imaging. I'll just type 
any call connection before we dive in, dive in. So there are lots of clinical imaging. Uh, let me just use, for example, New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a typical example of images in clinical medicine. Uh, these guys, they just have, let me see if you forget. You just publish an image, just something like this, as simple as this. Your name is going to be there. That's a publication. It counts for you. Sounds very simple, but it's doable. And I'll talk about the processes and how you go about, how you get this journal, how you contact them, how you send images to them, all that. So this is a form of case report, but it's called clinical imaging. You can do that in all aspects of publication, like I mentioned, like neuroimaging, you know, pathology reports, and whatever whatever subjects. These people, they didn't do any writing. So if you're thinking that there's going to be difficulty in writing case reports, this is just a simple, for whatever simple thing, and you just describe to them what you sent, and that's it. This is also an ophthalmologist view, uh, this. And that was the only thing he published, and it counted as publication, and it was indexed and PubMed for this particular person. So I don't want to stress much on clinical imaging. We might put my schedule and that they talk about clinical imaging, or just talk about the case report itself. I keep the time. Why is it important? We've breezed across why it's important to write a case report. Uh, I'll give an example of above all trying to um, get into fellowship, uh, academic progress, career research. Our most important thing is to improve patient care. And I'll give you an example how case reports has helped us during this period. You remember in the like, early 19th century, a lot of things that happened. Look at, for example, I circle these things. Things that happened in 19, 1891, 1896 was documented by someone. It was documented by someone like you and I. These guys, they don't have like two heads or three heads. They sat down, they wrote whatever they saw, and that helped to shape on the course of history. So if I look back to 1960, I'll see what happened with someone with measles. And that will help me to either improve on the management or question the management or help me to create a hypothesis or something moving forward in the clinical uh, setting. So it's very, very important to document things and case report plays are vital, especially in these days of internet where the uh, internet, the online library is taking over the hard paper copies of, uh, of publication. You find out that this online library has now become a new library, a new go-to place. So say for a new medical student that is coming into first year or second year medicine, might not be as knowledgeable as you are, but someday might come across what you wrote and will help the person, help the person generation upon generation. Just imagine in 300 years coming, what these, what the things that we have written today will help. Okay. Conclusion, conclusion of the right internal conception. Well, well, that what is that? That what it says? Yes. Yes. I see. She has last decided. Are you sure we should still see? So, so what are you guys thinking? You have to. Do we? Okay, so um, I need to share again. Hello, Edward. Yes, ma'am. Can you please make me a co-host so um I can I can do housekeeping so this doesn't interrupt you anymore? Thank you. Okay. So thanks, uh, for that. That skipped me. So those that that's important of one of the major important uh, importance of of case report is to help patient management, help to improve patient care. That's the most important above all that you want to do. And I've, I've given you an example where case reports have helped in improving patient management. Uh, for example, this COVID-19, we you notice that many of us reference back to what happened in 1918, 1919, during the Great Spanish Flu, between 1918 and 1921, between, during the Great Spanish Flu. And we saw how um, how isolation helped to curtail the spread of that virus. Someone actually wrote about isolation, reported it, maybe probably documented it in a journal. And then when we had a similar occurrence in 2019 to 2021 or ongoing, we referred back. 
to those those times and we said, oh wow, isolation helped during those days. And that I think that was what guided one of the things that guided public health experts in recommending isolation in, for the management of COVID as part of the routines for preventing the spread of COVID-19. <clears throat> uh, one of my favorite case reports is this, even though I cannot read it, it sounds very interesting. Eba Pyros was the first person that made it, a first medical documentation. And that's where history of case reports started um, growing. So in writing a case report, first thing I usually tell people is to demystify the content. Don't, don't, don't make it, don't make it look, um, don't, don't, don't make it sound tough to you. Remember when I was talking about perspective, it's simple. You saw a case, you're trying to tell people about it. How do you tell people about it? It's as simple as that. And uh, for you to demystify the, uh, the concept, you need to get familiar with the writing process. Then have a mentor. Sometimes it's, it's difficult in our contemporary world. We're working two jobs. A lot of residents are on call. People are, they leave in the morning, they come back in the night. That means they barely have time to do this. So we need collaborative effort. Uh, collaborative effort is something we've tried in our International Medical uh, IMG Research Academy, where one person will write introduction, another person will write, will do the literature search, another person will write conclusion. And you see that within one hour, uh, within four days, we've come out with a very beautiful case report or concept. And within two weeks, we've published. And people wonder how come we're always publishing every week. We use this collaborative approach to do because Henry doesn't have time, he's busy in his clinic, everyone doesn't have time, but everyone can squeeze in one hour on Saturday to just do an introduction, which takes nothing from our time. Edward will squeeze in one hour to do the case analysis or the description, and that person squeeze out two hours to do this. And when we do this collaborative effort, it, it, it helps a lot. So I encourage you, if this is your first time you're doing this, if you ask Tom to, we've, all, we've done, I don't want to mention it, but a lot of us in this team have done this collaborative team, we'll see how effective it is in helping to write a case report. So don't procrastinate. Um, part of the things that make people not to write is they will sleep, they wake up, oh, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Well, we know procrastination is a very, is a big devil or big barrier to things that we do. But try as much as possible to block out time. What I do is I block out time in the night around 11 and I wake up and I call Henry and we're always talking and we're writing and we're moving and we're talking and before you know we're done, before 11 or 12. Many of us, by 11 or 12, most of our calls in our respective, those are in residency, uh, are a little bit light. You can sit down and just draft out something, one or two things um, that will help you. So we're going to the detail itself, the core detail. There's this argument that Why should I report a case? What case qualifies to be reported? And the simple answer is every case, because the reason why you want to report a particular case or why you want to uh, publish a particular case might be different. Some other school of thought will say, oh, the case must be very fantastic and very phenomenal. Well, that's good for them if they are in that category. What is phenomenal to Mr. A might, be, might not be phenomenal to Mr. B. Imagine me saying that K needles or K nails are phenomenal in orthopedics. And how does it make sense to someone in dermatology? It doesn't make any sense to him, right? Or talking about triple bypass in surgery and, 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 and serial Basu, who is an ophthalmologist. It doesn't make any sense. It's not phenomenal to him. It might be phenomenal to you in surgery, I mean, there's not phenomenal to him in, 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 in his world, right? Or for example, a medical student or a, a high school graduate who's trying to pick up interest in, in, in medicine and happens to enjoy surfing the internet and stumbles across your simple case of describing urinary tract infection. Yeah, very simple case, everyday case. But you say, oh, wow, you mean you could have fever? In, when it's upper urinary tract infection and you don't have fever in or lower urinary tract infection, oh wow, you barely have fever. Oh wow, that's interesting. It picks up interest. Oh, this area, oh, you remember that you had this, this area or something that happened. And that spoils his interest. But to another person, that particular case is so simple urinary tract infection, what are you going to talk about it? And they condemn it outrightly. So I encourage everyone. Take the baby steps first, right? The simple things, the simple cough, the simple bronchitis, the simple dermatological presentations that you could see. The challenge that you might have with that is that you might have um, some well, some top-notch papers may not be may not be willing to accept everyday cases that they have published in the past. So you might have difficulties in getting to where you're going to publish it. But in terms of how do you identify a case? Every case is reportable. So I don't, I don't want to beat it 
I don't want to um, overstress on the, the fact that every case, every particular case is identifiable. Um, there's one famous example I usually use when we had smallpox. When they had, when they reported smallpox, uh, imagine the person that saw, saw it and said, "Oh, this is just a foreign one. It means nothing to him." But he reported it, and eventually, as time evolved, they, they found out that, "Oh, this is actually called smallpox, and this is actually very deadly." But if he had seen it initially as just a foreign call and said, "Oh, it's nothing. It doesn't mean anything," and discarded it. Maybe history would have been, maybe the spread of this, that, or that particular this illness would have wiped off so many people before they could discover that, oh, there's something going on. Having said that, whenever you identify a case, the next step is to obtain proper consent. So there's these ethical guidelines that guide us in, in research, even in medicine. You should not publish anybody's material in the public, even though you make as much effort as possible to de identify that material. You should not publish it if you don't obtain consent. And consent comes in various forms. Uh, the topic of consent, the ethical topic of the ethical concerns of consent is broad. It's not something I'm going to cover today. But just know that you can obtain consent following your institutions uh, institutions guidelines. So every um, institution will have their. Um, sorry, Eddie. Um, just some um, point of order. I can't see your screen share. It seems to be loading on my end. Is it loading on other people's end, or you're not sharing anything? I'm sharing it, but let me stop and share again. Stop. Um, is there another person seeing it? I'm yes, seeing I could. Um, I before you start writing, that's where he was. Yes, yes I, I can see it. Okay, okay I'll just um, sign off and come back then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you, so once you identify that particular case, you're doing a ward round. You're moving around. I'll address the, the uniqueness of people who don't work in the hospital. I'm going to address it on. Subsequently, but if you're working in a medical setting, outpatient or inpatient, you identify a particular case. The first thing is to obtain a consent, and to obtain a consent is easy. Um, you could do a verbal consent from with the person, and you document. Remember, in medicine, if you don't document it, it doesn't it did not happen. You could also do follow your institution guideline. Every institution have their guideline of obtaining consents. If you are um, in a in a setting where you don't have a formal guideline, we have consent forms in our in our academy that we can give you. It's pretty much straightforward telling the person. I'll share a typical example of a consent form. Uh, let's see if I can have it. Informed consent, okay. So can you see this? Can you see my screen? Um, yeah. you yes, 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 yes. So this is just a typical standard template that cuts across everywhere, every nation, every state, patient's name, uh, description of material, case report about it, provisional title, case report. And you tell the person, this is what I want to do. Talking about consent with the patient is very easy. Hey, we find your case very interesting. I will feel that the medical community will learn about it. Do you mind if we publish it? We're not going to put your name. We're not going to put your anything that will identify you. And I'll tell you what are identifiable materials when we get there. Identifiable materials are uh, uh, contacting editors, template, journal. Uh, I wrote it down so we can check care lists. Well, I'll share with you what are identifiable, uh, personal identifiable information, but I believe I'm talking to medical doctors. Everybody here is a medical doctor. We know what the identifiable material is, phone number, name, social security number, address, whatever. You're not going to put it in your case report ever. But we'll go into the structure of your case report when we get there. But in your consent, you just you need to obtain the patient's name and document and save it in the patient's file or patient's folder. But like I said, every institution have, has their. If you need this copy of uh, consent form, I can send it to you. If your institution doesn't have, you can you can provide them this. Uh, you can send this to your directors or your program directors, and they will modify it, and that will become a copy of your consent form. Um, Consent form mustn't be approved by an IRB. Sometimes they also approved by IRB. Many of the IRBs that you also have have their own consent form that they use. Um, so back to the process. So you obtain a consent. If you're obtaining a verbal consent, that's fine. There are certain situations where you it's not possible to obtain a consent. Let's say you are reviewing, you want to publish a case where the patient has died, right? So there's there, there's what they call their criteria for consent waivers. And one of the criteria is that you you you're not able to locate this patient anymore. That's one criteria for consent waiver. Or uh, the, the, the case poses minimal risk to the patient. And remember the word minimal risk vary. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say I have a foreign body stuck somewhere in my annals. I don't want anybody to report it because that might be my lifestyle that is identifiable to me. 
if I see that, if I see, let's say I, I, I came to your clinic and tomorrow I saw that you are writing about foreign body sucking in anus, I know that you're talking about me, that could be a legal case, even though you did not put an identifiable material, but if you had obtained, obtained proper consent from me, say, hey, this is an interesting thing, we want to teach people how to remove foreign bodies stuck in the anus. Well, so that's fine, go ahead. You know, so that if I see it tomorrow, that particular case identifies me because it's very unique to me, but because I've given you consent, then, you know, many of the litigations that will come after maybe, you know, very soft, I'm oh, sorry. After obtaining consent for the patient, next thing to do is to get an institutional approval. So you see these two parts, obtaining consent and getting an institutional approval, you will not be able to publish any case reports in major journals without submitting these two copies, consent or written document where the patient has given you consent and an institutional approval. Institutional approvals are, okay, remember that you're working under someone. Your hospital may not want you to publish anything in their hospital, in their name, without their approval because of the way the world is these days. It has to pass through legal process, it has to pass through compliance, like you know, the research institutes that worked, you need to pass through compliance, legal, and get a letter from them. And they have to review everything that you're publishing to be sure that it meets the standard that the hospital wants to represent. For example, Mayo Clinic doesn't want anybody to just write anything on their name and just put it out there and say, Dr. John Mayo Clinic, because whatever you're putting out there represents the institution, for example. So for those institutions that have those strong guidelines, you need to get an institutional approval. And it's easy to get an institutional approval. And we have a template. Just write to your head of department or director or the C or the GME or the CMAP or the president of the CME, whoever is in charge. I saw this particular case, interesting, I feel the medical community with this. I'm collaborating with Dr. A, B, C, D. We've obtained consent from the patient and we would like to publish it. You send it to the person and they give you an institutional approval. When they give you an institutional approval, the next thing to do is to get an IRB approval. Institutional review, an IRB approval is an ethical board that is set up to protect the patient, to protect the patient, to make sure that the patient is not taken advantage of in any form. So to make sure that you're not just reporting or co conniving or co- I don't know the word to use as a word. You're not doing something inappropriate. To get these two approvals, institutional review board approval, takes less than five days. Believe me, something I've done over and over and over again because many of them have templates. It's just check mark. Let me give you an example of getting an institutional approval from, let me say, one of the IRBs that I registered with. Let me move uh, Okay. So you just click. I have, I, 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 I I'm registered with these people. So you know, we could just do one like ASAP and we see what's going to happen. I hope to go to now, if you're working in a if you're working in a hustle, this is this is I click on Puma subject research. I'm sitting at home and I can just fill the form. Start X form and I, I click it, pump, 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 and I send. Fill the document and I send to them. It's easy. If you're not working on an institution that has an IRB approval, you can use what they call a central IRB. Central IRB, for example, is like an IRB that can take an approval from anybody in any part of the world. And a typical example is work. Uh, let's say sign into work. Let's see if I can remember what's my username. So this, I hope that's my user name. I can't remember my user name, but this is an example of the central IRB where they call it work, right? What it means is that if you if your hospital doesn't have an IRB or whatever you're working outpatient clinic or you're working in the health center, public health department that doesn't have an institutional review board, you can actually log in online with these guys, email them, tell them this is what I want to do. They will look at all your application. They have a template. Click, 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 click. 10 minutes, you're done. Uh, let me see if I have them open. I think I opened it first. Well, maybe at, before as the questions are coming. So they are, they, are, they are out there to help people. And there are several other globalized institutional review boards. So they look at your application ensure that you obtain consent, you follow the right process and they give you an approval. Usually the approvals come within 48, 
for eight hours because this is a case report. It's really, it does not involve, it involves minimal risks, that's the word. It involves minimal risks. As long as you're not trying to, you know, paint your institution bad or trying to paint the patient bad, they usually approve their things within five business days. And you get an approval letter. So with these two approval letters, consent form or a documentation of consent and an institutional approval, clause and IRB approval, you will go to the stages of drafting your report. So we've, we've talked about this and we, we said, how do you select a case? I don't want to repeat myself, but I'll just quickly talk about it because this slide seems to be seems to have shifted from where I, where I put it initially. A case that you want to share with others, new case, rare case, an unusual condition. We've talked about all these things, but like I said, these all these definitions they all vary depending on who's think what is new to you might not be new to another person. So if you say, "Oh, I saw a new case in this hospital," oh, that's fine. To another person, it might not be new. So somebody will argue, oh, it's not a novel therapeutic regimen. Why are you writing it? To you, it might be novel. So you could say, oh, to me, to us, this is the first time we're seeing it in our clinical practice. I've never seen an ectopic pregnancy. Absolutely. Some people here have never seen an ectopic pregnancy. My first encounter with an ectopic pregnancy could be a very interesting case report because that's my first encounter. But it, like I said, the problem that you might have is who will accept it for me because people have published ectopic pregnancies in the past. Uh, cost-effective diagnosis could be another thing to, to you manage a patient in a very cost-effective way and you want to write about it compared to what is the existing standard. Challenging diagnosis, you know, how all the, all the calls that you took before you were able to uh, get, get, to your, uh, get to your diagnosis was, could be also another one. So we are we're going to be referring back to this diagram. We're going to be going back and forth on this diagram. So I hear how to draft a case report. Before you draft a case report, the first thing that you have to remember is that you're, you want to publish it, right? And if you want to publish, you want to send it to a publisher. First thing is usually to identify a couple of publishers that you want to publish it, that you want to send it to, because they have a way that they want you to draft it. They have what they call an author's guide. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's say, Let's say journal of case reports. For example, journal of case reports, international journal of case reports, or whatever, journal of case reports, right? In this journal of case report, when you click on it, you see where the there's a home. Sorry, this your first one comes out. Let me use, use some, something that is easier. Okay. Scribe submission instruction for contributors. So here. In this particular place, they will tell you everything about how they want their own to be structured. So it's not one, one fitting rule for everyone. And I'll give you how you find these journals where you're going to submit. Uh, we'll look at another one. Uh, let's see another one. Uh, journal, of, journal of case reports on my publisher. American Journal of Case Reports. Okay, so American Journal of Case Reports, you see where this particular place where they say for authors, this will tell you if they are paid for, what is their timeline, instruction for authors, what kind of cases they take. Um, and remember that some journals are also disease focused or specialty focused. What kind of specialty they are taking, uh, what's their word count, how many paragraphs, how many pictures they allow, how many references they allow. Uh, what was the timeline, the review process, everything is going to be written here. So that's why I said in this particular place, don't reinvent the wheel, just go and follow them. So for, for us in IMG research, we've discovered a couple of journals, like four or five, that we really don't want to stress ourselves. We'll just stick with these people because we're used to that process. And if you find out that many, many writers, they just stick with five or six, except I see something very unique that I want to go and look for, Australian Journal of whatever. So we stick to them because I already know their process. I just follow their guideline. And I, it, it's very easy for me to submit. So you said the time we talked about is block the time in the night, focus on interest and area, join groups, have a mentor. Very important because your mentor, I have a mentor. A lot of us have mentors. After writing, I send it to my mentor. If they have the time, they look at it. You can also use your peer as your mentor. So we call it peer to peer review as your viewer who will look at it and say, okay, this is what I've written. Does it make it? Does it, does it does it make sense? The next thing is to open up and type. Now, what are you, what are you going to type? This is the outline of a simple case report. Most case reports, simple title. How do you form your title? 
Yeah, there are, there are several schools of thought in forming the title, but the best school of thought is just keep it simple. A case report on bladder cancer, simple. Or something unique, cost-effective management in bladder cancer. There's no, there's no one special way of creating a title. Just you have to just create something based on what you want to present, what you're focusing on, and how you want to present it. And there's a way also to write title. They call it the APA format of writing title. Now you see this particular thing, for example, this is a title, right? But it's not in an APA style. If it's an APA style, I have to use capital letter for every word that is greater than three. So this is outline, it's in capital letter, simple, off. Capital letter to start every word that is greater than three. That's the APA format like this should be in APA format. So that's title and like this should be in APA format reports. So, but these are technicalities that I'll discuss later when we get there. But however, remember that, remember that each journal is unique. Not every journal uses the APA guidelines. Some journals, they don't really don't care about these little, little details when they're making the first, the first letter of every word that is greater than three to be capital or letter or small. And most titles don't have a full stop at the end of the day. They just leave it open like this. So those are little, little technicalities, but this doesn't apply to every journal. Some journals, if you read their guideline, they will tell you how they want their title to be, and they'll give you an example. Don't reinvent the wheel, just follow it the way they want it to be. If they want their title to be less than 10 words, make it less than 10 words. Don't stress yourself about it. Then we have section for the authors, which everybody knows, John et al. in an abstract. And what do you do in an abstract? An abstract has, there are two ways to write it an abstract in, in case report, because today I said we're going to go into detail. One of the ways to write an abstract is structured abstract. And the other way to write an abstract is a non-structured abstract. And what is an abstract in summary? Everybody, many people get scared when they hear abstract, abstract, abstract. An abstract is just a sales speech, period. Oh, um, just imagine talking to Henry about a particular case I saw, uh, pancreatitis. Well, Henry, I saw a case of pancreatitis, very, very unique because uh, it came with challenges of thrombosis, uh, which we barely see in one in 1,000 people. Uh, eventually, we had to go through CT scan, MRI, MRI to make a diagnosis, or CR, MRI, magnetic re resonance angiography. To be to exclude that it was the patient was having. We saw a case of no. Let me start again. We saw a case of. Uh, an abdominal pain that was uh, retro, that radiated to the posterior or radiated to the back. And um, it happened to be a case of pancreatitis, but it had a twist because it, was, it also had uh, MRA and CT scan. It had a twist because we treated with the pancreatitis protocol and it did not resolve. We thought of something else and we did an MRA or CT scan and came back positive for a thrombosis or um, a Pancreatic artery thrombosis or media, whatever artery, abdominal aorta thrombosis or whatever, media collateral, lateral, whatever artery thrombosis. And when we started uh, anticoagulants, pain resolved. Oh, interesting case. Uh, so that becomes an abstract. So in summary, it's like you're summarizing the case, you're making a sales pitch, trying to make, bring. So once someone reads your abstract, the person will be able to say, oh, what is this case all about? And what are they, why are they trying to share it? What is the case? What did you do? Why are you trying to share it to us? That becomes your abstract. Three simple, three simple paragraphs. Uh, some abstracts are structured. I'll give you an example of a structured abstract. Let me just pull it up on the internet. Uh, structured abstracts. Structured abstracts. Structured abstracts uh, could be like this. Writing a structured abstract. Uh, so I have one in our folder. Let's see, structured abstract. Okay. Well, if you just type writing a structured abstract, you see how it is. And like I said, I usually I'll piggyback back to what I said initially. Uh, this is how to write a structured abstract. This is an example of a structured abstract. These are all examples of structured abstracts. As introduction, body, and conclusion. That's it. End of story. But the uh, but the journal that you're going to submit has their recommendation or has their guideline on what type of abstract that you are. If you run out of time for you. All right. So that's how we write an abstract. Introduction is pretty much easy. It has three components. The statement of facts or the existing condition or the existing situation. 
surrounding that particular thing that you are writing. Uh, usually, we all know that the introduction usually has, you know, the, the opening, the intro, introduction to the disease entity, your introduction to that particular objective that you want to write. Remember that you have uh, you have an objective in mind while writing this case. So, introduction to it. I may have a case a case of uh, bronchitis, but I'm not. I don't. But I'm trying to write a case, not just on bronchitis, but probably on the public effects of bronchitis, of not managing bronchitis. So my introduction might not necessarily circle on ep the epidemiology of bronchitis. My introduction might just circle around the public effects of these upper respiratory tract infections, and then piggyback on bronchitis a little bit, and then go to my case. Right. So that's usually how you write an introduction: statement of facts. Then the last paragraph in introduction, usually three paragraphs, most of the time, you know, introduces your ties your case to the to what you've written in the, in the remaining two paragraphs, right? In the statement of facts that you're making in the two paragraphs. All right. Then after the introduction, you do a case description. Um, okay. Yeah. So sorry to go back a little bit. So this is like a, an example of a structured. Abstracts, right? Has an objective, method, what I did, qualitative analysis. So, in method for case reports, we reported a case of a 21 year old man with, with uh, whatever, uh, right abdominal quadrant pain that eventually turned out to become a malignancy instead of appendicitis. Simple, right? Results, we don't have to put results in case report, you just put your conclusion. Conclusion every right abdominal quadrant pain should be carefully examined to avoid misdiagnosis. That becomes a conclusion. That's a structured abstract. You can also remove these headings, method, objective. That becomes your structured abstract. Most, uh, most, most uh, conferences that you want to present to usually have this structured abstract as a method because it tells, it quickly tells where's your conclusion. I go to your conclusion and I just write about it. I'll share this slide at the end of the day so you could see this, uh, this the breakdowns. Um, so these are components that will be in an abstract, like I said before, clear background, key component, tie, it, tie the last paragraph with your case and the abstract, and that's it, basically. And we jump to introduction, uh, a slide on the anatomy of introduction, simple opening, we've talked about it, critical opening, there are different types of uh, introduction, writing introductions, but the most important, the thing that is important is the statement of facts, the reason why the the the, the statement of facts, the the the, clear, the statement of facts, the first first paragraph, the second paragraph is the the, the lacuna or the, the problem you want to solve, and the last paragraph is how your case solves that particular problem. So statement of fact, the problem you want to solve, and how your case solves that particular problem. That's how I summarize it. Uh, if, you, if you go through this slide, you get more details about, about, about this. Now, we now come to the, the third part, the case description itself. So how do you write the case description? The same way you present your case in word drum is almost the same way you write a case description. But the only difference is that you're not, you're not going to put this identifiable usually nine identifiable, personal health identifiable information that we or as medical doctors know. Age, name, no, date of birth, name, addresses, uh, phone numbers, social security numbers, bank accounts, anything that will identify that particular person, you have to take it out. Right, so that's the content of the case report. A 21 year old man presented with this, the same way we present in the very chronological order. So you talk, describe the case, describe your examination, describe your uh, investigations, put a table of your results. If, if the paper wants you to put your results in table, some papers want you to put your results in tables also, complete blood count or CMP, uh, your radiology your ultrasound, everything in table. Some papers just want to just lump it in the case, so depending on the case. So don't reinvent the wheel, because if you reinvent the wheel, the, the publisher is going to reject it, because they have a way that they want their cases to be presented, right? So but pretty much they all, most, most of them all have the same pattern of presenting. Then, and that's, that's the put your vital signs, and that's, that's pretty much how to do a case description. Easy, 
easy. 21 year old man, follow the chronology of how we present in hospitals, remove all the identifiable information, examination, investigation, found this. Now the difference is the, the specifics in writing a case report is that sometimes you, you don't now need to go all out to all the investigations, only the pertinent investigations that matter in this particular thing. Now, if I'm describing an orthopedic case, for example, or I'm describing a dermatological case, someone that has uh, skin rash, I might talk about hypothyroidism, T T TSH, probably because it may be associated, right? But I don't have to be going to talk about the urinalysis because the, 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 the association between that skin rash and urinalysis may be far-fetched. I said that is what you want to talk about in your case report. So those things that really don't matter, that don't really, uh, don't really add to the value of your case. You don't really necessarily need to put it. Your case should, the case description should be sweet and simple and straight to, the, straight to the point. Key important things, avoid abbreviations, avoid abbreviations. Everybody knows what ROS is in medical world, but a medical student may not necessarily know what this is. Now remember that not only medical students read our, read our reports, every other person, journalists, people, magazines, they go online, they search for anything and they read about it. So you may know, all of us here may know what ROS means, but another person doesn't necessarily know what another review of system means in, in, in medical problems. So ensure that you don't use uh, 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 abbreviation, especially in the first time. You may use abbreviations and you may use the description and abbreviation, let's say review of system in bracket ROS, and subsequently you're not doing your ROS uh, going forward. So that's how to write the content of the case description. The next part of the, the outline is the discussion. Now this becomes more technical depending on how, how much you have written before. Um, I think this slide is trying to tell us those identifiable information here. So name and so many things on biometric identification. These are all renowned identifiable information that you should not add when you're writing a case report because they have to the patient. But we've talked about this. So we're in the discussion part. So it, 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 this part becomes a little bit technical, right? If you've not written one before, but I tell you, there's no guidelines or writing to talking about discussion. Your level of the depth of a discussion depends on your depth of experience and actually what message you want to pass. If I'm one, of, if I'm talking about pancreatitis, let me just pull up a case I wrote. I'll give an example: active pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. See Kobe. See. See. I'm just trying to pull up one of the cases that we wrote. Uh, let's say Kobe. Just give me one moment. I had it up before. We're going to talk about it as well. Let's see if it's this one. Uh, we'll just pull up something. Okay, so we wrote this one, me and OJ and some other people. Um, it's PubMed index. Uh, let's see if we can find it in PubMed. 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 It's, it's, it's also PubMed index, and we wrote this particular thing. So the, 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 way we, the way we did the discussion, the pattern we use is that we were talking about our patient and also um, bringing what is happening in the general population in parallel. That means for us to bring what happens in the general population in parallel, we would have done what they call a literature review. So we have looked at various literature. So these are citations for the various literatures that we did. So if you see apopancreatitis is a clinical, is a disease characterized by a recurrent episode of pancreatitis, blah, 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 suspected of a second episode, blah, 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 among the At the end of the, after discussing the general population, we now brought in our own, what is unique or how our patient's presentation differed or tallied with the general population. 
And that's pretty much what we did throughout the presentation, right? So that's a style of writing uh, a discussion. Another style of writing a discussion is you have what you want to, the, the objective in mind, and you circle all your discussions around that objective without even mentioning your patient because you've already done the description at the end of the day. Then at the end of the paragraphs or the last paragraph in the discussion, in the discussion, you just say that your patient's presentations, they mimic these findings or they give you an exemplary view of what is happening in the society or what the government should do or whatever recommendation. So there's no there's no true guideway. How long will how lengthy will the discussion be? It all depends on the journal's guidelines. Some journals have 1,300 words, some journals have 500 words, some journals have 400 words. So like I said initially, you have to don't reinvent the wheel, know how many words the journal wants, and then you uh, and then you follow their will and do it the way they want it to be done. So like a uh, writing style varies, I don't know academic style. We know that every time you're writing, you're writing in a formal style, not an informal style. So not I or this patient presented, not I saw a patient, you know. So we're writing in a very formal style. We're not putting any informal thing in our, in our discussions. How to reference also, how to add these references. So for every categorical, let me pull up this thing. Okay. For every categorical statement you make, I'm almost done. For every categorical statement you, you make in a publication, it has to have a citation. What do I mean by categorical statement? So if I say pancreatitis is common in fair people, in people that are white, you know, in the Caucasians, where did I get that statement from? Did I manufacture it from my head? If I manufactured it from my head, then okay. Well, well, many of the time, why they call these things color is that they have to be able to trace, they have to be able to trace this, uh, this this statement of facts that I made to someone, and these were the people that made those statements, these people, right? So they have to be able to trace it to this other guy, and this guy that made the statement has to be able to trace it to another person, whoever that did the preclinical, whoever that discovered it eventually, and that's how they link one authentic fact to the next authentic fact. And every time you're submitting an article to anybody or anywhere, the authors, they usually verify these facts that you claim. And if they find out that you're making it up, then they will be, you know, have sanctions, buy you, reject your paper or whatever. So let's, let's say this guy submitted something and he referenced these people and they verify the statement that he referenced and they can't find it here. They're gonna, that's where the peer review comes. They're gonna call your attention. And you made a social statement in paragraph four and you said that this person said that kind of, uh, marijuana smoking is common amongst the elderly. How did you get that? Was that from a clinical research or where? Where did you, did you just manufacture it? And they go to that site and they click on it and they read through and they could not find where cannabis smoking is common in elderly people. They don't query your write-up. And when they begin to query your write-up, very often they'll begin to reject you or they'll particularly reject that particular paper. So that's a citation. There are various ways of citing a paper. We're gonna talk about it when I get to the last part of this discussion. I'm almost done in probably 10, five minutes. The conclusion is usually very pretty much simple. Just state the conclusion of your finding. Don't, it's not a place to repeat the discussion. Acute pancreatitis is common in middle age group, period. Simple. One or two paragraphs, simple. The other part of conclusion that they usually encourage people is to now open a, 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 an opportunity for people to use it as thesis for research. I'll give you an example. Let me pull up something that, uh, that we're working on. Um, so we're working on a paper to see what, how, how what the, to see the effect of cannabis on, on marijuana smoking, right? And we did, and we did, and we did all our research and we could not find anybody that has done a randomized clinical trial using cannabis to manage postpartum depression, despite the anecdotal claims out there that 
or cannabis helps people to calm them down, to help with their sleep, to help relieve anxiety, but there was no evidential research. So we saw it there and said, therefore, we said we did not see anything that all these people are claiming after doing all the various services, so close to like 15,000 papers. Therefore, we call for expansion of legalization. Therefore, as the call for expansion of legalization of marijuana increases, we call for caution. Further research is therefore needed to douse the anecdotal claims. So in our paper, we went through all the papers that we were trying to review, and we could not see any evidential claim that cannabis is useful, as people claim, to help relax anxiety or do this. Like when I mean randomized clinical trial. So in our in our closing statement, we put it there. So this could be, someone could read it, and that's where we get most of our ideas in the interventional research. In fact, pharmaceutical companies, that's where they get most of their ideas. When they read most of these papers, many of the papers, they come up with a conclusion that wants further clarity. So, oh, time enough, six, six gram is, is, um, is, uh, is uh, toxic, right? But it was just done in the Caucasians. So someone will just write it there. Oh, boy, the limitation was that that research, I found that time now six, six grams or six, is it six kilograms, whatever six it is, four to six grams is toxic to the liver. But that experiment was done only in the Caucasian. It wasn't done in the African population, African American population. It wasn't done in the Indians. It wasn't done in this. So that could be part of your closing. So you're opening it as a research ground. So when I read your paper, I will see the research statement or a possible hypothesis or research question that, that would drive me into further uh, other actions. So that's how to write conclusion. Keep it simple, write your conclusion, what you found, put a research statement, possible an advice or a caution, and you're done. There are various types of referencing tools, uh, APA, Vancouver, MLA. Don't stress yourself about how do I use references tools? Should I use Mendeley? Should I use this? Should I use uh, this software? Should I use that software? The way I do it, I keep it very simple. Let me give you an example. Um, so in writing this paper, I did not use anything like Mendeley, whatever, but you could use whatever works for you, right? I just put the author's name here, right? And the author that I'm referencing, all the authors are referenced, I make them bold, I make them bold. All these, these are authors that made these statements in this paper that we're trying to publish, right? And we make them bold. At the end of the day, down, 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 I put all the links here, right? So number one, DSMV manual five said this, BNJ said this, I got this from this, I got this from that, I got it from that. When I go to the manual, when I go to the journal, let's say this journal that I want to write, there's an instruction on how to reference on this journal that I want to submit. I want to submit on this journal, journal of case report. The instructions on referencing, you read it carefully and you follow it and that's it. So at the end of the day, I just copy my link this is my link, I just copy my link, I come to how they want me to reference, I look at it, I input it the way they want me to reference, they want me to use the APA pattern, they want me to use the MLA pattern, they have their own referencing software. Many of these journals, they also have their own referencing software. I'll give you an example, Curious, uh, where is Curious? This is their referencing software. So if I want to reference, I click on it, let's say article, this is the references software. So I put the author, I put the title, I put source, I put here, I put this, I put this, and I click on save and it to save. I don't have to go through Mendeley or whatever software that people have. Similarly, British Medical Journal, all the big journals, American Heart Association, just name all of them. They all have their own referencing softwares in locked in, or they have your way of referencing. So you don't have to stress yourself on, or oh, how do I reference? Just keep it simple. Note where the statement is, either with number or with name, I use name. At the end of the day, when I'm submitting, I begin to now interchange these things. I begin to interchange these names with the numbers that the software has generated. So I know where Shackler is. I just changed it to 23. I know these are print to four. I know these are changed to two or one or whatever. And by the time you do it one or two times, it's pretty much easy to do. Lastly, before I end and open the floor for discussion, um, where do I publish after writing all this? Ensure that someone else looks, reviews it, a peer reviewer reviews it. Because sometimes you might think you're making sense and you're writing to yourself and you feel happy and just writing and you're going and you're going and you're going. And when Dr. Ade just came to review my paper that I was writing and he made a lot of comments and I was so pissed. And we had to start writing, we started writing all over and over again. He made all these comments. Why did you put this is not true? This is this, this is that. He made all these comments. He was reviewing it for me and I was like, oh man. 
So I wasted like two weeks of my time writing this particular thing. But what he said was true because I was blindsided by my own personal belief. You remember that there's what they call author's bias, right? So ensure that someone else looks over your writing, your peer, your mentor to you know, help you make sure that you're coming out and saying, when my manuscript is ready, and I have to choose what journal to submit it to submit it to. A lot of things are coming to mind when I'm choosing my journal, and it varies from people to people. What are the authentic journals out there that you want to choose? And there are lots of them. So I have some, um, I have some, I have some, I have some guide, or I have some links of where so many journals are. I will share with you. You send me an email. I'll send you this material. You click on a journal guide. And you see what title of the manuscript that you want to write. You put a case report on pancreatitis. You put pancreatitis. And you put manuscript abstract. You paste it there and you search. And it's going to pull up journals. These are all journals that are writing on pancreatitis that are accepting. And in these journals, they're going to tell me their impact factor. Impact factor is just about how well rated they are, the higher the impact factor, the better. How many journals are they publishing? Do they publish within the past one year? There's a calculation for impact factor. And that tells you how this, the old known journals, Oxford journals, those ones are started like in 1930s, they have good impact factors. And the younger journals are just started today, like my journal that I'm trying to build. I may not even have an impact factor, but I hope that before I run for 10 years, I'll have an impact factor. But that does not mean that I'm fake. I may not be as standard as they are, but that doesn't mean nothing. But they are also predatory journals. Predatory journals are journals that will collect some money and they don't do anything. You know, they just have a sham website or they do not have uh, proper registration with the appropriate regulatory authorities or the regulatory, because it's the regulatory authority that regulates all these things that we do. The other things that you want to put in mind is what, who do you want to index your paper? I like PubMed, so I ensure that whatever paper I want to submit, they index my write-up in PubMed. There are other indexing centers. PubMed is not the only one. Remember that PubMed is for the American government. The American Library of Medicine is PubMed. So people should not confuse it with a journal. It's not a journal. It's just like an online library where it's like a repository. And there's so many others, Chrome's, Google Scholar, Kate, EBSCO, name it. I have a lot of them here, Open Center, whatever. I prefer PubMed because kind of you know, the American system, they think they're higher. Well, maybe they are, who knows, their standard, right, on the paper that they assess. The next thing I think of is, what's the time that I have to publish? So some of these journals, I'll give an example. I have another journal publishing, uh, journal publishing, journal publishing. Journal publishing. Let's see. Let's see. Let me see this. So I have this list of journals. What time and how much do they charge? Let's say this journal, AGP, charges, $1,400. I don't have $1,400 to publish a simple UTI. I mean, except my institution is going to pay for me. Some of them are free, but they might be free like BMJ, but they may take one year to review your paper. For example, I just clicked on BMJ and you find out that their review time might just be endless, like last forever. Right? So you have to look at the author's guidelines and see some of our 700, some are 800, and some are very expensive, like 5,000, 10,000 going forward and forward and forward. So you have to be careful, to read carefully what is their timeline. I have an application in September. I have another application in November. I need my journal, I need my article to be out. I don't care what journal it is, right? I need my article to be out and I need it to be out and reposited in the place that I want it to be reposited. So I look for those journals that uh, may not be that 100% standard according to people's definition of standard, but at least they're going to be, give me my paper out. And I, and they're going to at least do some, something minimal, minimally accepted, acceptable norm and, you know, prepare me and publish my journal. Journal charges are um, copyright. Let me give you an example. So this will charge $903. Do I have it? How many people are collaborating with me? Let's say we have 10 people collaborating with me. So by the time we pay $100, will have 900 and will be able to publish, right? Not only that, you have to also look at how many authors they permit per case report. Some journals just permit only three authors. Some journals permit 50 authors. Some journals permit two authors. Like I said, in our research group, we've been able to identify some journals that just give us the minimum that we just require and we are used to that process and we go. So ensure that the journal has an ISSS number, impact factor, we talked about it, predatory journal, we talked about it. That, that term, predatory journal, is 
it varies because like I said, I'm growing my own journal. I'm, I don't want someone to call me predictory because I'm growing. Let's imagine you imagine when British Medical Journal started in 1930 and someone turned them predictory and that eventually made them not to grow. You know, so I'm very careful on being careful on calling other journals predictory. They're also trying to grow their grow themselves, something they will get there. So these are factors that I consider. So I have a list of where to publish. I can share these things with you, how to publish, how to find them. Like this first one that I, 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 I clicked on. Um, in one moment, let me see. Journal repository. So like this, this is a very good guide on how to find a journal that is suitable in your region. Journal name, just put it there, or paper match, put your title and to direct to your publisher or category, and the thousands of journals will pop up. Uh, if you want it, send me an email, I'll share with you for free. Um, last is food tip that I want to mention. Understand your work environment because various workplaces have your work environment. If you are confused, talk with me. I'm easy, I'm easy to reach. You send me an email, hey, I have this interesting case. How do I go about it? I'll tell you the steps. But we've already written the steps. You have this at the end of the day, how you obtain your, your consent. And don't be scared to tell your superiors or your supervisors that you want to write a case report because they are also very interested. Everybody wants to want someone that wants to write a case report on their behalf and they put their name as a supervisor or whatever and they get free publication. Master the ethics committee, MS World on Excel, contacting journals. So there's also something I do if I'm confused if this journal is going to accept my paper or not. I have a template here that I use in contacting editors. So I have like 50 editors in their emails. I just send glass this email to all of them. Hey, I'm writing to inquire about the instability of my paper in your journal, in your ABC, blah, 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 my title, my objective. I just put this and I send it to him and I expect him to answer me. Uh, if you want me to share the, the, the emails of thousands of um, thousands of of journals, I could share that with you and your research team. Let me see. Give me one moment. So we have these emails. My team has already done this research spreadsheet of whatever emails that we have for different different people and different different responsibilities and who is who journal contacted, who we contacted, and we did not thousands of them. I could share them with you for free if you want. So you could just blast them on email and say, hey, I have this case report. Are you going to accept it? I can share the template with you if you want. They will respond to you and say, yeah, we're accepting now. Feel free to call them on the phone, ask them other questions. How much is the publication fee? What's the timeline? What's the possibility that I'm going to be accepted? Because some journals have very terrible rejection rates. Some journals have close to like 94% rejection rate. That means for every nine people, every 10 people they accept, they reject 9.4. Well, you don't want to be in that category when you're looking to uh, publish within the next six weeks, and they are, you, are, you want to put your, you want to submit in a journal that wants to reject nine percent, ten out of nine. Because remember that these journals are also business; they are looking for articles that they want to publish that will attract people to their side. And because the more people come to their side, the more they drive internet traffic, the more they get patronage from advertisements and pharmaceutical companies. And many of these journals are also paid for, right? So it's a business model. They're not just going to accept from Henry Lutheran. Who's Henry Lutheran? He's just at his residency. They don't know, know him, but he might accept from Professor Smith, who has who's a renowned person because everybody wants to read from Professor Smith, who's the CDC director, right? So they will probably reject Henry Lutheran. They call it publisher's bias also. And they also what they call reviewer's bias. Reviewer's bias is that whenever they look at your name, they might just say, oh, because his, his name is OK, Noel Kobe. Oh, he's an African. They rejected my paper based on my name. These things are real. It happens every day. Or they'll say, oh, Indians write very well. So they accept an Indian person. So these are all different types of biases that happen. So oftentimes I tell people, once you identify a niche, three, five, 10 journals that you are comfortable with, don't stress yourself running around. Just stick with them. The publisher knows you. You have established a relationship with the publisher. And the more it is to accept your journal. Um, in conclusion, I know this is supposed to be a 30 minute or 45 minutes talk. So in writing a, a case report, I'm 
talked about the nitty gritties. I may not have exhausted everything, but just talk less when you want to write. Just sit down and write. Bring out your typing fingers. Set a goal. And we can review your timeline in two weeks. Between now, if you set a goal and say, I want to publish. Now, the last part I want to talk about before I give acknowledgement to my wife, and my friends, and all the people that, fast, that uh, enabled this uh, conversation to take place. There are some people that have very unique conditions. They're not in any residency program. They're not in any place. They're just trying to apply or they're in medical school. They don't have access to these cases. So how do you mitigate this? That's where the power of networking comes. I have a lot of my colleagues that are in Nigeria. Uh, I believe many of us here are from Nigeria that are willing to collaborate with me to give me a case. I tell you, if I call Joseph now, we could try it. I'll just call Joseph, hey, Joseph, do you have any case that is interesting? And so yes, I do because Joseph may not have the funds. I'm not saying he doesn't have the funds. May not have the funds. I have the funds. We all work as a team. He gives me the case. I use it. My I, I write it. I have the technicalities. I write it, and we all go. And you can achieve. You can actually produce a case report in less than two weeks. I'm not talking from not just exaggerating. Every every one of us know here. So power of collaboration. Call your schools, call your mates, call people, junior ones, contact people that are in the residency program, a voice in the residency program, tell her to look out for you, help her through the process. She does not have the time, but you have the time. So you are the one that, that, that needs, needs it the most. Um, I think I've exhausted my time. Thank you so much for this question. Free question. You can open your mic and ask uh, Dr. Ivo and Dr. Henry can take over. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, Harry, why did your name close my mouth? <laughs> I don't you. know. I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you. I think because I saw you eating bounty and I was judging you in my mind, just so you know. <laughs> All right, thank you, Edward, for this. It was beautiful, it was quite informative, and you made it look very, very simple. I think uh, with most, for most of us, for most people who have not had any experience with case, uh, with case reports, they've seen that it's something that is actually achievable, and as, you, and as you said, it can be done in two to six weeks, as long as you make up your mind to do something. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to look for the, a case that has all the, you know, an unusual case. It can just be something commonplace. So thank you very much. We have some questions in the chat box. So I'm just going to start with, um, yes, I'm just going to start with this question. Someone asked um, about the central IRB you spoke about, right, for references. That's so for private hospitals in Nigeria, can we use the central IRB or are there other options? Yeah, very good question. Thank you for that. So I've, I've also worked with people in Benin. I know that in, in Benin, they have an IRB, very standard ethical IRB. In Unibend, they have an IRB. Uh, even Central Hospital Benin has an IRB. One of the cases that we published during this time, COVID, I, I collaborated with some doctors there. We published an analysis of what happened in COVID in Nigeria, in that uh, Midwestern region in Nigeria. And we use Central Hospital Benin IRB, like, yes, Central Hospital Benin IRB. Okay, so that Central Hospital is a government hospital. So what about those in private settings? So those in private settings, the two institutional approvals that you need is, the head of the private hospital has to give you an approval. If you are the head of the private hospital, you have to have an approval. Just a simple template. You can send in the template and get an approval. You can also sit down on your laptop and just submit that approval to where I got an approval from my hospital to publish a case, a case of this, this, this. This is the objective of the case. This is what I intend to, to intend to achieve. That is the standard template of work. And they don't charge you anymore. You don't pay nothing. It's free, absolutely free. That's a second scenario. A third scenario is that you can look for an institution around you, many big institutions around you, and actually register in the IRB. Now there's also another, another option an ethics committee. So an ethics committee is usually headed by the CMAC for those in Nigeria. The ethics committee of many hospitals are headed by the CMAC. That their approval is equivalent to an IRB's approval. So for example, I schooled in Iroa State uh, Teaching Hospital. So the CMAC can give an ethics waiver for consent or can give an approval for case report. And that is acceptable in any journal because 
He is the head of the ethics committee. Remember that what this ethics committee do is that they help to protect the patient. The function of an Arab is to help you protect the patient. So if an ethics committee reviews what you want to do and you want to publish a case and they approve you, it's almost equivalent, almost the word is almost equivalent to what an Arab does. So if you have an ethics committee in any nearby hospital, use them. If you have a government IRB, use them. If you don't have anyone, contact anybody that has anyone because an IRB is not also not usually also not regional, regional, right? Let's say this Nova IRB can approve a case that you're doing in Medigree, right? As long as you follow the tenets of their agreements, you will not publish the patient's name, you will not do this, you will not violate patient's right, you will not, whatever the terms of the agreement, they're going to review it and they will approve it for you. So I hope I answered that. Okay, thank you so much. And then um, a question that I'm sure is on the mind of my Canadians, right? So we're thinking, so we have um, over 100 people in a group. How do you think we should go about writing case reports? Like should each person just go and search for case reports and start writing on their own? Or, uh, can you give us a structure of how to go forward and ensure that people get that writing? Yeah, so the first, when we started our academy, it was, we had a similar problem. First thing that we did is we call for interest. So there are some people that have interest in family medicine, some people that have interest in psychiatry. Excuse me. There's people that have interest in this. So when we call for that interest, we notice, okay, we reduce the number from 100 to like 20 or 30 or 40. Now, 40 of us cannot be in the paper, especially case reports. Maximum, most of these journals taking case reports are usually five to 15. Some of them are very stringent, three. Uh, so it now becomes who gets the case reports, who gets the case and who he wants to add, right? who he wants to partner with, who wants to tag along, people that can function. So somehow what an unwritten rule will help you to narrow down. First step, first practical step is to identify what areas you're applying to that will guide you. But many of us are applying to internal medicine. So almost half of us will you know, indicate interest in all internal medicine because many of us are applying to a wide array of specialties. And the next step is to find these case reports. And if you set a goal today that you're going to reach out to like 10 of your friends, just the way you are going to reach out when you're applying for a job and take it seriously and say, I'm going to reach out to my friends to say, hey, do you have any, any case? Not even say I'm interested in it. Do you have any case in your hospital? Of course you have. Oh, there was a case I managed in my hospital when I was in Lekki. I contacted Dr. Hugo. Hey, Hugo, do you have the case description for this particular case? He will say, yes, I have. All right. Fine. Next thing, I write the, the head of the hospital. Hey, I'm Edward. I worked in this particular hospital. There was a case I managed. I really want to, I want to publish it. He gives me an institutional approval. Next step is, uh, Hugo, can you, is there an IRB there? Is that an ethic committee? Oh, no, there's not. Okay, Hugo is too busy. He doesn't answer me. I log into web. I got an institutional approval from these people. This is the case. This is where I want to publish this. this follow the guideline. And in one week, I get my approval. So once I get my approval, Hugo has the case already. Hey, Hugo, I've forgotten that particular case. Can you send it to me? Send it to me. There's also something I did not talk about. They call it the hypothetical case. There's a, what they call hypothetical cases. Hypothetical cases are, these cases really do not, they don't exist. So you just made it up. Where, you're, where these journals are focusing on are the discussion part. You want to discuss on the part of etiology of of asbestosis or of mesothelioma or how, why transteratin appears in the trans, whatever they call it, is in the heart and why it's not in the liver, and why it's more detected in the brain or the plaques. So you just create a scenario, 78 year old man with Alzheimer comes with heart failure, blah, blah, restrictive cardiomyopathy, blah, 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 create that scenario. Then when you go to discussion and you write, this is a hypothetical case. These journals also accept hypothetical cases, and you tell them in the last statement in your, in your introduction why you are choosing a hypothetical case. Let's say this is often missed scenario, or this is a new diagnosis, or this is recently seen, or COVID in this, you know, and you just create a scenario, you talk about it, or is a new finding, something that is coming up. Let's say, for example, I believe I my site just created a PO that you will swallow and to send signals to the company that you are compliant with this particular medication, right? That's a very new technology. And many people are not aware of it. So I can create a particular case of, of schizophrenia. And I'm, all I want to write is this new technology that I swallow pills and it tells the company and I review all the improvements in technology from 1960 to now. 
and that becomes my case report. And I submit it in two, less than two weeks. That particular hypothetical case, I don't need an approval for it. I can do it myself. I just sit down, create an hypothetical case, contact this journal. Hey, I have a hypothetical case I want to talk about. And they reply you and you submit. Sweet and simple. I, I can pull up journals with hypothetical cases. So while the questions are coming, let me just see. Okay. Um, I think for now, <clears throat> there are no extra questions. But um, so speaking again for those of us over here, so we get a stroke, we get to, we get some um, our interest groups, and then each person you sort of like pull in your own partner, right? So I was thinking of sort of like forming groups. How how do you think that would work? Yeah, so I'm still in that particular group. I'll put in my energy as usual and see if I can actually get one or two cases from people where people are going to publish and I will call for interest. I'll use that as, um, as a test study to see how forming groups of people, you know, the social studies and people, are, uh, social behavior and people are dynamic. You might call a group of 10, only two people will be very active and the other nine people will give excuse because for, for various reasons, either because they're not used to the process, they don't have the time generally, or they have the time generally, but they don't have the knowledge, so that slows them down. They have the time and the knowledge, but they are too, whatever it is, too expertise to come down to your level to have a meeting with you. Um, so I believe if we group ourselves in fives, that, that, that will work, we are 100 now, we group ourselves in fives and say, okay, five of us, let's, let's form a team. Let's begin to contact people and get a case, or let's do a hypothetical case between now and the end of August, which is like four, four to six weeks. So you choose either to do the real case or you don't want to do the hypothetical case. You contact the journal, give us feedback, you draft the case, I'll do the discussion on what, what, what's the objective. So we come, first of all, come out with an objective. What, what do we want to talk about? Right. And there's so many ideas of what you want to talk about. Medicine is inexhaustible. And uh, if we if we divide ourselves in a group of five, we should be able to achieve something between now and end of August. Writing the case, we may not have hundred percent success rate, but at least forty to sixty percent of us, might if we're serious, we should be able to produce something. Okay. Thank you so much, Edward. And um, we have Tom here. We have Dr. Tom Elimihere here. I think Tom has volunteered to also help us, um, um, help to be like a peer guide here for us. So, Tom, are you around? Okay, so he's probably not here, but um, he's probably- I am, here. I am here, but I've been here all day all along. I'm, right, listening to my, so I'm listening to my professor talk. So what do I have to say when it is talking? But anyway, <laughs> just one or two things though. Uh, I was I was typing when you were actually saying what I was around. What okay. forming forming groups, one of the things ID has been able to do in its group actually is people bringing topics and just say, okay, we have this topic and who is interested. You see people showing interest. Okay, I'm interested, I'm interested. Then he gets to a cap and say, okay, we've got into a cap. So that kind of interest actually more. Uh, organic than if you put people together, then you put people that are not like minds together. At the end of the day, 